this is a National Tashaw Council update with Amerindian leaders. I'm your host, Roma Ruknarang. Joining me on this program are two leaders. We have to my immediate left, Mr. Ernest Samuels, and he is the Tashaw for Whitewater community in Region 1. And to his left is Mr. Amon Tom, the CDC chairman for Wauna, also in Region 1. Welcome to the program, gentlemen. Thank you. Now, you would have been attending the, um, the NTC, but we will come to that a bit later. Um, we want to get into um, a bit with regards to your, your communities. And even though you are in Region 1, we know that you have your own unique challenges and so forth. Um, so we could start with the community uh, of Whitewater. And maybe we could start, let's say, on the issue of health. How have things been, but you're free to just speak in general, how have things been in your community over these past few years? Well, for the past few years in my community, we find a great challenge because for the health center in my village, at most times we charge it of drugs. And sometimes patients come there and be whole day and they don't have no drugs to treat them. Sometimes we have to follow them to the big hospital to Mabarumo. From there sometimes they even don't even get drugs sometimes, but they need it. So on the health part at the moment is that even don't have a solar bulb or anything in the health center, where at night sometimes patients come and uh, the health workers have to use their torchlight to look to patients. And it was just amazing to me sometimes we had a, a case as we had an emergency case where they had a torchlight with a midwife to deliver this baby. And uh, there was a lot of different things in the part of the health healthcare. So mostly is that drugs is our most challenges right now in our health center in Whitewater. But I want to say in the previous time in the PPP government, we never ever run out of drugs. At sometimes even in the health center when we go, we find that even drugs are expired because there are a lot of drugs in the health center. But at present moment, drugs run out clean. There is no drugs. So people sometimes leave it out. In the malaria case, right now is raining into the village. At many times, the people get smeared. They, they doesn't get any treatment. They, hold, they get them a hole that they got to wait this afternoon, tomorrow. In a, in a sense case that one man died because he didn't have no drugs. So even to had a baby that died, that then they had no drugs. So they, they, they take the smear, it show positive that they have malaria, but they don't have no drugs. They say they had to wait on Mabruma to send in drugs. So before the drugs that reach, the baby die. Even the, the, the man has passed away. So we are facing a great challenge. So in the PPP days, we had a lot of drugs. That is my part on health in my village, Whitewater. Um, um, for me, for the past few years, indeed, um, in the health sector, uh, we would have seen a decline as it relates to the effective functioning of the health sector. Now, why I said that is because um, in my village, there is one health worker there, and at one time, he would have had to use a phone light to deliver a child up because there is no electricity there. Added to that, I would have visited other areas where they said they requested um, for drugs on several occasions. And then it took a while, like three months before it could reach. And when the drugs do reach the health center, it already expired. So they can't use the drugs still. So definitely there is um, indeed a shortage of drugs, as my colleague rightly said. Coming to the ambulance, when you call the hospital for the ambulance, they have a whole lot of questions to ask, ask before. They could tell you, okay, I'm going to call you back. Only to know after an hour, half an hour, hour and a half, nobody called. You have to call back again. 
Um, there was an instance where a gentleman came, the uh, relative came to my mother to make a call because they didn't have a cell phone. She made a call and she don't know the gentleman personally. So they start asking the question and she said, this is not a time to ask questions. This man is um, very weak, send the ambulance. They told her they will call back. After two hours, they didn't call back. So my mother called and then the ambulance came. The gentleman reached to the hospital but was too weak maybe to take whatever they were, they were going to give him and he died. So definitely we're seeing that the service of the health sector under this government for me is not as compared to the previous government because we never suffer so much under the health. Now, um, in addition yes. to that, in my part as my colleague speaks about um, the ambulance um, truly indeed, the ambulance do come into our village is an emergency case, but the distance sometimes in maternity case where at one time um, there were three babies born in my yard because I'm in two shows, they come to me to, to get transportation to come into the village where I call the health worker and she made the call to Mabruma and it take like two hours and a half to reach into the village and at the time the woman was in pain there into the yard so before the ambulance can reach there the baby born into the yard and in three occasions it happened so and even so recently one of the migrants is there she was in pain of baby and they were coming across to me to call on the ambulance so before they come reach to me the baby born in the road car <laughs> so and in the previous time of the government, we had our community village bus where we never face all of these challenges. So in any maternity case, we made it available to bring out our people to the hospital and to, to get their babies into the hospital. So in this case, we find a lot of big, big, big changes of whatever is happening into our village in the challenge of health care. What are you, and, and you mentioned the issue with lights, and in this case, solar lights. Um, these health facilities don't have it. Um, the midwives, the health workers, they have to operate with phone lights at night to deliver babies. Um, whatever happened to, under the previous government, the PUPC, there was the solar uh, hinterland electrification program yeah. where so solar panels and batteries and so forth were distributed to hinterland homes. Did your communities benefit from that project? Yes, for me, um, Paitwata has been benefited from the solar and batteries, and even so the health center has been benefit from, benefited from the solar and batteries, but the lifespan from then to now, everything gone through, so there is... So the lifespan for the battery would have expired? Yes, expired. So what has happened since then? Um, over the, since this past four years with the new government? There were no replacement of battery. No ministers didn't come in to find out what is our situation and problems. So we have been forced to buy a little battery. Sometimes our solar is there. So buy a little batteries just to get our home in little lights. And that is how we operate in the village. While some in darkness, though they have the solar, who cannot, who cannot afford to buy a battery, the solar is there in the house, but cannot get any light. Um, they are doing the same thing in one house. Um, yes, a satellite community which is Sugar Hill would have benefited from that project. But as I said, as you rightly said to date, nobody would have done anything to replace those batteries and stuff so that the people can continue to have lights in their homes. So that's it. And and stemming from that, um, we could already see the effects students depending on that to study in the evenings and so forth, moving into the education sector. Um, how would you describe what has been happening um, over the past four years in the education sector? I'm going to probably start with you. Um, for me, um, like I would say that there wasn't much personally um, in my village that they would have done towards education. Because um, in the grade six, there is a need for globe. For that, for example, a need for a world map. You ask several... several um, officials from the ministry visited, you make requests, okay, yes, we're going to do it. But today, that's just promises. Nobody do, uh, would have done anything. So I can safely say the lack of resources 
would have been a problem for the past four years. Um, textbook, they're trying to pour resources, but then when you lo look at the textbook um, again, it's just you're getting a part of it, and some schools are benefiting more than some with the little resource that you're giving, and in some cases, none at all. So there would have been a decline as it relates to resource under the education sector. Do you find, I mean, I find this incredulous that you're saying this, uh, bearing in mind that um, Mr. Granger and some of his former ministers, they have been they have been saying that they spent over 170 billion dollars in the education sector. A lot of that going in hinterland areas um, since they came to government. Now that does not match up with with the reality on the ground. Well, it's, um, you see, these are the things because when they put those um, those um, large budget into the newspaper, people in the hinterland it's not like a case where we're not receiving. Um, these um, newspapers, we know exactly. So when you do compare it, you don't know where the money is going because definitely it's not in the education sector. So that's a question to be answered as to where the money would have been poured, really. You understand? Mr. Samuels? In my situation in my school, my, um, Whitewater, and even other school, my neighboring school, that is Kamwati, even so, um, we, didn't, we are not benefiting anything concerning the school because I'm too short for there. And uh, number one, they were, they, in the previous government, I must say that we were receiving school uniforms for our student in school. And the present date, we, since this government took, took over office, we are not receiving, our student, children are not receiving any uniforms. So we don't know where these monies are going. And uh, the school, also the solar have been, gone through. And I think recently we had this non-government um, organization that is Food for the Poor upgraded a little in the school. So we get the, the solar system working in the school so far. So in the education system from the government, there is no assistance to my school into the Whitewater um, village so far. And then it's generally because if you look at other schools, other schools, um, when you go to visit some reverend school especially, and you see the step falling apart, um, we were, I went to a reverend school and they're complaining that they would have made several requests to have a new school built because of the, um, the one that they have currently is sinking. And then when you check the furniture, there is a shortage of furniture throughout because um, in one school you have like 354 um, pupils. And then when you look at the furniture, um, in some class you'd find like three children, um, pupils sitting um, together. So again, the question is where this um, large um, lump sum of money went? Because we're not seeing it in the hinterland. You understand? We don't, we don't really understand. Now, now, I want to shift slightly to a different sector. Both of your communities, Wauna and Whitewater, White mm -hmm. depend on agriculture um, to, to a reasonable extent, right? Mm -hmm. um, for citizens, their livelihood. What has been the, in terms of um, the assistance and technical and other resource support that you would have received um, over the life of this, this past government, the APNO FC? For me, I would say if you say wrong, agriculture is dead. They might want to say that the, the residents there are lazy, but then if we plant, where um, are we getting our produce off? You understand? Because if we're depending on that for our livelihood, then we need somewhere where we can sell our produce. There is no avenues being um, provided by the government so that we can have our produce being taken off. Um, we had a lot of um, agencies and organizations visiting the communities promising that they're going to do this and they're going to do that, make proposals and so on. And I remember up to the other day, because I recently took over in the community, and a young lady reached me and she said that they promised her that they're going to um, purchase her cow's rib and her cassava to put in the Guyana um, shop. And today nobody came back because they promised her bottles and labels and so on. And nobody went back to the community. So for me, I can safely say in Wangna, agriculture is dead. No assistance from the government. Mr. Samuels, what's going yeah, on? Yeah, in my community, my village rather, is the same. For agriculture, we of ourselves, we are striving with our normal farming as planting cassava or our um, ground provisions and stuff with our own natural labor. But then on the agriculture side, 
there has not been even a agriculture officer to visit our community to say this is anything but recently on the same season that in January, February that is our normal time that we do our farming and the cassava some farms has been take over with the worms that has been dropping and we ask for poison like FASTA to assist us to um, spray the cassava with the poison so that we can get the worms off of the cassava. So they said that when I talked to the agriculture officer to Komaka, he said that by all those things done. Because I know in the previous government they had poisons like fastax and all different um, poisons that we can get from them to the agriculture. So he said that up to now we can get nothing. He said them things there should be requests, but we are not receiving anything. I said, but still, yeah, I could go into the villages and give us some encouragement. Maybe we can use other um, strategies as to get these worms off because there's a lot of people suffering with the worms in the village. So we are not getting any assistance from any agriculture officer in the region. And there is no minister even so coming. And sometimes as we hear when ministers do come, is we hear they're sneaking, sneak out and they go. They, they have, you know, in the previous government, I always admire this, is they, they go according to the act of the Amerindian. They made requests or they write a letter to us sometime two weeks or a week in advance saying that uh, we are paying a visit to your community. So, so date, so, so time, we will be there. And we know and we, we expect them, we organize people to come out to the meetings, but so far we never ever get those part of it. We hear people just come, going out, they have like, to me, like there is no respect for the village council. And uh, we just be cool because we don't know what this is all about. Maybe that is their strategy of been working in the villages, so we don't say anything. Do you feel disrespected? We feel disrespected. And those... How many is the same, same yeah, issue? Um, I remember one time, um, the minister was in there. She went to check on the HES program, and that's something I'm going to speak about just now. She went to check on the HES program, and it was until she could not have found one of the participants. Then I was um, made aware that somebody is in the village. But when it comes to actual engagement with the residents, there was no um, formal engagement with residents from any minister since they would have um, taken office in 2015. So nobody visited. And when it comes to like grants and stuff, the only thing we benefited um, from them is through the um, presidential grant. Other than that, nothing. So they're not going, they're not assisting. I don't know for what reason, um, but I remember um, having an encounter with one of the ministers, and she told me on my face that she's not going to help me because I'm a PPP. So I don't know if that is what public offices are actually coming to now when it comes to assistance with certain things. I don't know. A, a minister then yes, told you to your face that she will not provide assistance yes. to your community because you are PVP? To me personally. And because you are PVP. And I think that is where, that is what they're using to not help my community because I'm there now. You're spiting the community? I think so, because of me. That, that is outrageous. It is. You said you wanted to talk about the, his program? Yes. Um, the, uh, they promised the, his um, participants 50000 bonus after their six months of training and their business up and running. I was invited to a consultation with uh, Minister Ali Kak for them to have this um, grant. When I reached there, out of 30 participants, only like nine persons received the 50000 So I started questioning who submitted names and stuff. Because I'm the leader and I didn't submit any names, so I don't know how these nine names would have um, reached the, um, the accounts department. But they received. So I resubmitted the, uh, the other list with like 17 plus um, participants for the 50,000. Now they, they have these participants going through, I would say, stress because they want pictures, they want verification um, of the business and so on. My point is, if you're saying that they are, um, you would have trained 4,000 plus his um, participants and so many flourishing businesses, in my community there is no flourishing business to talk about. Because the thing is, you just train them, 
you left them, nobody monitored um, the participants. Wait, just take a pin there. You were saying that these people just came to a workshop and that was it? Nobody yeah. is coming constantly to, to, check on to, the, uh, to give them guidance, to assist them, yeah. to provide continued support for them? They have just been left yeah. in the wilderness and then they come back and, and they see who is still surviving? Yeah, and remember that these are young people, right? And $50,000 for me cannot compensate because they are young. So some of them would have left to go in the mines and so on with the hope that to get some money to come and continue their little um, business that they have. So presently they are being faced with the challenge of having that extra 50000 And I'm concerned because as the leader of the village, people look up to me um, for representation. But there is only so much I could do at the community level, which the um, majority of it is left on the ministry. And if they're not showing this interest in youths, as they, um, they would have spoken about, then I see different. Because the youths, they're becoming frustrated when it comes to, especially the 50,000 grant. Because some of them said to me plainly, um, I ain't fed up, I ain't able, because printing pictures is money. Where are we getting the money from? One time they were told that agriculture is not a business. So I don't know where this is coming mm -hmm. from. They were told that agriculture is not a business. By officials from the government? Um, I would say employee of the government. Employees of the of government. Of the government, yes. That agriculture is it's not, not a, business. a business. Wow. And then employees reporting to the ministry, stating that this person um, don't have business, that person have anything. But the reality is that they never visited these persons. After taking leadership of the community, I visited most of the participants. And there is evidence of agriculture, some people doing like, um, like um, planting peppers and even making them into the pepper sauce. And that is a good business for me. They have other vegetables and other um, like, let me say, um, cash crops like bora and stuff. But all of that has been driven into the ground because of no support, no following up. Yeah. And they're doing it, but not as um, with any support from the government because nobody visited them to say, okay, this is what you should have been doing, or this is what you should do. You understand? Or this is what and yet doing. they're reporting that these people don't have any business going on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I really don't know if there is favoritism as it relates to the grant, or it's only the Apple supporters receiving the grant. I'm not sure what is it. But I have a lot in my community who is currently frustrated as it relates to the um, his program. Now, moving over, we come to the close of the... Um, program, but I want to touch quickly on sports. Sports is a big, uh, big thing. We are you, you're talking about youths. Um, what has been happening in terms of sports, support for sports in your communities? It's dead. One is dead. That's all. It's dead. That's it's dead. That, that, that's how you describe it. Yeah, it's, it's dead. dead. Nobody saw, Nobody came in. Nobody. Whatever. Nobody cares. Yeah, nobody cares about it. And then. If nobody cares, where where our support supposed to be coming from as the government? Yes, we can have a group there, a sports group, but then, if you don't have the support from the government, again, I'm saying it, you you care so much for youths, why is it you're not supporting them? You understand? And for me, sports is a big thing in a community because it can help alleviate certain social ills in the community. Yes. You understand? And if, the, if that is not there, then youths are going to find idle time to do other things. Right? Exactly. And then you have an increase in crime and then mm -hmm. you reach over to the security aspect. You understand, they're being charged and so on, which for me is not good. So for me, sport is dead. Is it the same thing? The there? same thing with me, with um, the sport. Sport is even dead in my village. As my colleague said, it, it's just the same. Youths are now not being played. Now they, they have been taking out the challenges and drinking rum. Sometimes they smoke the marijuana and the evening bar and we have to attend court with police matters and these things because of lack of um, support. support. Okay. And um, there is no one, that there, there is a CDO in my region where at one time a heart she bring football, but there is a small satellite area in my village that where she go, there is a few um, supporters of the APNU there. So maybe because of that, she's there to go and support them and she's or providing gears of footballs and cricket little gears and stuff like that. But she never ever come in our area to say what is it area anything all about. So it's heavily politicized or even if it's yes. being done. Um, 
but I want to touch quickly before um, as we come to the close of the program. Um, both of you gentlemen would have been attending the NTC, uh, which is still ongoing. Now, um, I understand that the format was slightly adjusted and that areas have been lumped, you know, with one representative basically. Um, how would you describe that? Has it been, do you think it has been effective or, you know, it, it is not serving its purpose? Um, for me, this is my first time at the National Two Shows Conference. And I, I don't want to go back to 2018 because I won't, I won't be able to compare. But what I've seen here is that they're trying to silence um, leaders because we were placed in cluster and give our, um, our issues to one leader to present. And in my case, the leader would have read all the community's issues and then miss mine. Now for me, if you bring in leaders, right, you need to hear from leaders because I would have mentioned to one of uh, my colleagues that all the communities might have a problem moving a bottle from this point to that point, right? That's the issue. But then how was the bottle moved? It's going, it's going to be different in various communities. So that leader won't be able to explain and express um, themselves for other leaders, you know? But if you're given the opportunity, then you would know how to explain. And today, I had issues to raise with them um, when it comes to infrastructure. And twice I um, tap on the, um, the microphone to speak, and I didn't get the opportunity to speak. So I asked to see the minister personally, and I didn't even get to see the minister. So for me, they're trying to silence leaders. And as a representative of my community, I'm here to represent them. Now when I go back to my community, people very well, other leaders might say, no, I didn't speak at the conference. But it's not a case where I don't want to speak, but I wasn't given the opportunity to speak. So the bottom line is they're just trying to pick and choose who they want to speak, especially their supporters, to have a good name. And that's not good because at one time you hear they don't want to hear issues and complaints. They want just a report from the community. So tell me if we're coming, we're leaving our region to represent our people, where the council is faced with the issue in the community. And that's complaint from the community. So I don't see if we're receiving complaints from residents, why is it we must just come and give a report to the armed conference? It doesn't make sense. If for me, it's just a waste of time coming and just sitting in a conference, listening to ministers lecture to you all day. For me, I get bored. I like to talk. Has that happened? It I happened. Think. It happened the very first day they came in at the opening. We didn't see back the president. I think today they went because they were invited. And I guess he will do the same, just talk and then left. No proper engagement with leaders. Unlike with the previous um, government, I was told, with um, leaders from my village, interaction was there, you know? So I'm seeing this as if, though, they're just putting up a show. So the NTC now becomes a show for the, um, for the government. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Samuels, do um, you agree with, with those views? Yes, I agree with my colleagues at least because I too feel the same. Because I was, I was there, was raising my hands for um, for my issue of my village because as we, my colleague said they have been put one person with all the problems from the communities but the person that who has been representing these things are not representing to how we want uh, to explain it to what is happening and they are skipping communities villages and things like that because I my, myself have to do my own representation because my name is not calling and there is 2,800 people that is there back in my village waiting for reports that I would carry back to them what they would be wanted to hear. So I had to try my best to try to raise little issues but then I still didn't get the, 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 um, the opportunity to do so. They were saying we are part of this minister have to speak, that minister have to speak. So we have most of the minister to speak than we have to speak. So. The national two shows become as a minister two shows um, <laughs> conference. Sorry, so we we have no less time, the limited time to speak. So we only have to listen. So our brains are not computer to hear all of this stuff. My head is hurt, so I, I eventually have to step out to the conference. So the ministers, the well, the, I would say in this case, former ministers, they hijacked the conference and they were lecturing all the time. And Amerindian leaders. Um, who were, and, and that is the idea to hear from Amerindian leaders there, 
um, that was not the case. It was basically diluted, and you weren't get a chance. You weren't. You were not getting a chance to be heard. Yeah. Instead, yeah. the the former ministers took over the show, and they were lecturing to Tamarindians. Yeah. Well, with that, I'd like to thank both of you for joining me on the program, um, for giving us um, a detailed uh, understanding of not just what is happening in your communities, but the challenges you are facing at the NTC level to have your issues addressed. Um, we were talking with Mr. Amon Tom, the CDC chairman for Wauna in Region 1, and also Mr. Ornest Samuels, the Tishau of Whitewater in Region 1. I am your host, Romel Rukhnarain. Goodbye.